Hi, I'm Leah Clark. I'm an art historian and I specialize in the Italian Renaissance. And like many of us, I've been spending much more time in my home during COVID-19 lockdowns. And I've been paying particular attention to the objects in my home, especially those ones that often feature in the background of my online meetings. And around me are objects that I've picked up from my travels or that I've inherited. So for example, ceramic blue and white, there's metalware, I have a glass here I picked up on my travels as well. And under my feet is an Indian carpet I picked up in India as a child. Each of my objects has a story to tell. It might be a memory, an heirloom, or a reminder of past travels. And what about the objects in your home? The items we put on display are often a reflection of how we want to be seen. And for centuries, people have decorated their homes with objects from around the world, which tell fascinating stories, but also sometimes troubling stories. Today, paintings or sculptures often take pride of place in art history. But for me, it's the material culture, the kinds of ceramics or metalwork that decorated the homes in the past that tell really interesting and fascinating stories. With this in mind, we asked you to send us images of objects in your homes and to tell us briefly where they came from and what they mean to you. I have a particular fondness for blue and white ceramics. Um, and you can see here, I have a pot that I'm using as a plant holder that I picked up in a charity shop. In the Renaissance, Europeans absolutely loved Chinese blue and white porcelain and they used it in different ways. So sometimes it was just used for display, other times they may have used it to hold spices. And in some cases, blue and white ceramics were also used as plant holders. This pot was sent in by Amy Laverick, an object she picked up specifically for its decorative value. And it shows that even today we are still drawn to these blue and white motifs. So why was Chinese porcelain highly prized in Europe? Well, it was partly because no one knew actually how it was made. Some thought it was magical, speculated as a precious stone or a marvelous liquid that solidified underground. And so in Europe, there was a constant attempt to try to make it. And it wasn't until the 16th century that they slightly succeeded. That is in Florence in the 16th century under the Medici, they attempted to make what is called Medici porcelain. Although you can really clearly see there was lots of trial and error. So the examples that survive from the Medici porcelain factories show, for example, where pigments have bled during firing or in some examples where pots or vases are kind of skewed. If we look at paintings of the time of domestic interiors, we can get a better idea of the types of objects that were on display in Italian Renaissance homes. So take, for example, this fresco by the Florentine artist Ghirlandaio, which was painted in 1480 in the Church of Ogni Santi or All Saints in Florence. In some ways, this painting is an illustration of a quintessential Renaissance study with an emphasis on learning and the classical architecture, a kind of reference to classical antiquity. But when we look more closely at the image, another story begins to be told. We see objects from around the world. So for example, glass vases, we see alberelli or drug jars, ceramics. We see a carpet, probably a Turkish carpet. And this points to an international luxury trade that stretched from China through Persia and across the Mediterranean. When Guerlain Dayo painted this painting in 1480, it is a significant moment in time. In the decade that followed, in the 1490s, Christopher Columbus would go on to discover the so-called New World. And in the other direction, Vasco da Gama would discover the sea routes all the way to the Orient. And this would open up the world on a real global scale, allowing more luxury objects to enter European homes. True, this wasn't today's globalized world where you can click on a button on the internet and get something from China into Europe within a matter of days. But it does show that the world was opening up and that global trade would become central to many individuals, even if they didn't travel themselves. Take, for example, the two drug jars or alberelli on the shelf above St. Jerome. These drug jars were probably made in Europe, um, in Valencia, Spain, or in Florence, Italy. But what they show is an incorporation of designs from ceramics that are being imported into Europe. So, for example, blue and white Chinese motifs become incorporated into local production. On the top shelf, you can see some glass vessels. And when we think of glass production today, we often think of Murano 
in Venice. And for example, Nadia sent in this Venetian glass lamp that again hints at the history of glass making in the region. So glass is a really interesting example of how technology is transferred around the making of certain materials. So gilded and enameled glass produced in Egypt and Syria under the Mamluks at the end of the medieval period had a great impact on European taste. It wasn't until the 14th century that enameled glass was produced in Venice. Um, it, historically, it was a technique developed by Islamic glass blowers and imported into Venice, possibly via Byzantium. But by the 15th century, it becomes something that is really associated with Venetian manufacture. And what's interesting is by the 16th century, we see Venetians manufacturing mosque lamps being imported back into Syria. So you see this real technological transfer over time. Another common item we find in Renaissance homes are incense burners, something that we still use today. And we can see this lovely example that was sent in from Anita. This is our incense burner. It was my grandfather's. Metal incense burners were often decorated with beautiful interlacing motifs that were described in inventories as Damascene. And this actually referenced the place of manufacture, Damascus. Once again, though, we see the import of these items into Venice and soon Venetian craftsmen learn this technique. And so in some cases, we actually don't know if these items were made in Venice or in Syria. Renaissance artists also found these objects particularly fascinating. And we start to see in the late 15th century and into the 16th century, things like Chinese porcelain appearing in paintings of the time. You might want to take a closer look at some of the objects in your home and think about the stories and the journeys that they tell, but also the cross-cultural interactions that have long shaped the world.